The year is 1918. In Germany, what started as a sailors' revolt in Kiel has spiraled into a nationwide revolution. All of the major cities, Hamburg, Bremen, Munich, and even Berlin have fallen to the revolutionaries. In its desperation, the German government has removed eight divisions from the front. But out of the tens of thousands of men who should have arrived in Berlin, barely 800 actually made it. These few remaining men were ordered to dislodge revolutionary sailors who were held up in the Marstall Palace's stables. After shelling it for more than an hour, to no success, a crowd gathered around the scene. The soldiers quickly fled. So that was it. That was the German government's best attempt to stop the revolution. Would Germany really join Russia and become the world's second communist power? No, because in a Franciscan friary located in Westphalia, the counter-revolution was gathering. So you can call me Ezekiel. These are the German Fry Corps. Let's jump in! General Ludwig von Merker spent the end of the war as the leader of the rather unimportant 214th Rifle Division. Like the rest of the army, the enlisted men of the 214th were becoming increasingly socialist, while its officers remained staunch conservatives and monarchists. With revolution sweeping across Germany, Merker and his officers decided to act. They left their rapidly dissolving division for Westphalia, where they recruited a new army of peasants, the middle class, right-wing students, and loyal war veterans. By the time of the Marstall fiasco, this first Fry Corps had 4,000 men, and they were all marching to Berlin. They arrived just in time, because on the 5th of January, a massive protest was called. The crowd is estimated to have been at least 700,000 people. Many were armed, and some were members of the Spartacist League. The Spartacists were not moderate socialists, but radical Bolshevik-style communists. The protests soon turned violent, and they seized Berlin's vital newspaper district. It was this increasingly violent situation that Merker and his men would find themselves in. But luckily, they weren't alone. Other army officers had the same idea as him, so more Fry Corps were joining them in Berlin. Eventually, orders supposedly from the government reached the various units, telling them to retake the newspaper district and other key locations. The Fry Corps' tactics were similar to those of the stormtroopers of the Great War, spearheading their attacks with artillery, flamethrowers, and machine guns before seizing enemy strongholds by storm. The Fry Corps had very little difficulty defeating the poorly armed and led revolutionaries. But unfortunately, discipline usually broke down after combat, and the Fry Corps developed a habit of roughing up and sometimes outright executing their prisoners. Spartacist Week, as it would come to be known, ended on the night of January 11th, when the Fry Corps assaulted the revolutionary headquarters in the police presidium. After point-blank artillery caused the building to collapse, stormtroopers seized the ruin. Order was finally restored to Berlin. But before the revolution could be truly ended, there was one last job to do. The Spartacist leaders, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, were still on the run. On the evening of January 15th, the two were discovered in the home of one of Liebknecht's relatives. The pair were taken to the Eden Hotel, where they were verbally and then physically assaulted. After their identities were established, Liebknecht was taken outside, struck in the head with a rifle, driven to a public park, and finally shot to death. Luxembourg was taken outside shortly after, also struck in the head with a rifle, and driven some hundred yards away. What happened next is unclear, but it's most likely that she was also shot. Her body was discovered five months later stuck in a lock of the Landwehr Canal. It had been wired and weighted down with stones. With Berlin secure, the government's attention turned to the rest of the country. While they held elections, Merker's Fry Corps secured the town of Weimar, where Parliament was to be held. But the rest of the country was still in open revolt. The most important region to secure was Germany's coast and its vital port cities. Recapturing them would reopen Germany to international trade, saving the economy and allowing the import of much-needed food. After winning a battle that saw 300 communists either killed or captured, the Fry Corps took Bremen. The rest of the major ports surrendered to the government by the middle of February. The following months saw the towns in the Ruhr and central Germany go through their own socialist uprisings, all of which were put down by the Fry Corps. Berlin itself also had another uprising, so it's a good thing the government was based in Weimar. Once again, the street fighting was brutal, and even involved Fry Corps airstrikes, but by March 13th, the second Berlin uprising was crushed. 12 to 1500 were killed, while between 10 and 12,000 were wounded. With internal affairs finally calming down, the Fry Corps' attention was directed outside of Germany and into the Baltic. The German landholders there were calling for help. 
Rich landholding Germans were a long-running staple of the Baltics, so when the Russian Revolution came a-knocking, German nationalists wanted to save them. The Allies also wanted the Bolsheviks out of the area, so they gave the go-ahead for the Germans to recruit Freikorps to fight in the Baltics. By February of 1919, tens of thousands of volunteers were arriving in Latvia. They were organized into two main formations, the Iron Division and the Baltic Landswehr. The latter was officially under the control of the Latvian government, but less than one-fifth of it were actual Latvians. These formations had no trouble sweeping away the Red Armies of 1919, so by March, most of the Baltic coast was clear of Reds. Now, there had always been tension between the wealthy Germans and the local peoples of the Baltic. This concerned the Latvian government, who took action by arresting one of the German officers. They accused him of plotting to overthrow the government. This enraged the Freikorps, who proceeded to overthrow the government. Both the German government and the Allies were furious at the Freikorps for doing this. Berlin ordered a halt to their advance. But do you remember how the Baltic landswear was technically not under Berlin's command, but Latvia's? Yeah, well, they just used them to continue the advance. So by the 22nd of May, they were in the Latvian capital of Riga. The Allies responded by helping the Latvians and Estonians raise national armies. It wasn't difficult to find recruits, since the Freikorps were behaving abominably. They murdered 3,000 civilians in Riga alone. With Allied help, the Nationalists defeated the Freikorps and retook Riga. This forced the Freikorps into a slow retreat back to Germany, but that didn't stop them from committing more atrocities along the way. The retreat broke down in November, when a significant number of Freikorpsmen got surrounded near Thorinsburg. They had to be saved by a new Freikorps specifically recruited for the task. But, after marching all the way from Berlin, this new Freikorps rescued their comrades. So while all this was going on, one city had yet to be liberated from the revolutionaries. Munich. Events there had taken a turn for the strange. On the 7th of November, 1918, socialist political leaders called for peace demonstrations in the city. Things proceeded smoothly, until a man sporting an unkempt beard, floppy-brimmed hat, and ponze attracted the crowd's attention. He implored the soldiers of Munich to return to their barracks, win over their comrades, arrest their officers, and bring the revolution to the city. Incredibly, they listened to him. And thus, the Bavarian Soviet Republic was born. This strange man's name was Kurt Eisner. Shortly after his remarkable success, Kurt met with the city Soviets and established himself as the head of the revolution. Unfortunately, his new regime had some problems, and Kurt had strange ideas for how he was going to fix them. Bavaria's economy was rapidly deteriorating, and food was coming into short supply. Eisner responded by writing and putting on performances of revolutionary hymns, and advertising programs of democracy and education. After inevitably doing poorly in the scheduled elections, Eisner was assassinated by a rightist. This heralded some absolutely absurd leftist infighting, more political violence and assassinations, and the taking of hostages from the city's bourgeoisie. Luckily, the men who replaced Eisner had a plan. They knew that their regime was unpopular, and so took the only reasonable course of action left to them. They declared war on Switzerland! And Württemberg, which was another state in Germany. Okay, I'm being a little unfair here. The guy who did that was quickly removed, but he illustrates the caliber of people this government attracted. Eventually, they were all replaced by a crew of professional Bolsheviks sent from Russia. They chose to begin one of the strangest Red Terrors I've ever read about. It included all of the usual land appropriation and robbery, but the people of the city responded not with horror, but by initiating an orgy of debauchery and bacchanalism, the exact kind that would define the Weimar Republic for decades to come. So let's take a step back here and consider Bavaria. The German state of Bavaria was three things. It was very Catholic, it was very conservative, and it was very, very anti-Semitic. A large number of the men involved in the Munich Revolution, including Kurt Eisner himself, happened to be Jewish. So if putting a bunch of socialist, atheist Jews in charge of the most conservative, the most Catholic, and the most anti-Semitic part of Germany seems like a bad idea, well, that's because it was. The Bavarian right was pissed. After failing to end the revolution with local troops, help from Berlin was requested. On the 27th of April, 1919, 30,000 Freikorpsmen crossed into Bavaria, easily sweeping away the revolutionary resistance. By the time they reached the city, the communist government ordered the execution of a hundred of their prisoners. Twenty were murdered before another officer countermanded the order. Incredibly, 
Two prominent future Nazis, Rudolf Hess and Adolf Hitler himself, narrowly escaped being among those hundred prisoners. On May 1st, the middle class and clergy welcomed the Freikorps into the city. The socialist nightmare was finally over. But a new nightmare was just beginning. The Freikorps carried out reprisal killings throughout the city, but they did a very sloppy job of it, and at some points chose to murder people at random. By the time it was over, they killed at least 1,200 people, many of whom were totally innocent. So, up until now, the Freikorps' actions were kind of odd. You see, most of them were nationalists and monarchists, and yet they'd spent the last few years fighting to defend a social democrat republic. So with the revolution finally put down, some Freikorps decided to do something about it. Their attempt to seize political control would be known as the Cap Push. Most of the pushists would be veterans of the Baltic Campaign, who were still seething over what they saw as a stab in the back from their own government. On the 12th of March, 1920, the coup began with Earhart's brigade marching into Berlin. Some men carried the old imperial banner, while others had swastikas painted on their helmets, although it should be noted that the symbol was not yet associated with the Nazis. Now, the government knew this was coming, and had already abandoned the city. They also called for a nationwide general strike. The most important strikers were the government bureaucrats, without whom there was no way to communicate with the Freikorps outside of Berlin. Many of them probably would have joined the uprising if they knew what was happening. By the 18th, the whole thing fell apart. Pro-government revolutionaries were taking control of the country, and virtually no support materialized for the push. Earhart's brigade chose to leave Berlin. They were seen off by a mocking crowd. At one point, a young boy broke out in laughter. This enraged two of the soldiers who broke rank and brutally beat him. When the crowd protested, the whole brigade fired a volley at them before finally departing. The government's quick response and the people's support successfully prevented a right-wing takeover of the new German Republic. In fact, they were a little too successful. The pro-government strikes in the Ruhr quickly degenerated into anti-government revolution. Fighting broke out in the town of Hagen and quickly spread from there. A little more than a week after the cap push ended, the whole Ruhr was red, and the Red Army of the Ruhr swelled to 50,000 men. Once again, the government turned to the Freikorps for salvation, the very same Freikorps whose own revolution they just suppressed. Even though the communists had impressive numbers, plus a fair amount of heavy equipment, they were not professional soldiers, so as soon as the Freikorps fully committed themselves, they put down the uprising. As per usual, they freely executed prisoners, civilians affiliated with the communists, and probably a lot of innocent people too. So with an estimated 20,000 leftists eliminated, and the most radical elements of the Freikorps forced underground by the cap push, peace, or something like it, finally fell on Germany. The coming years would see little need for the Freikorps. Their biggest action would be against the Poles in Silesia, but after doing their job, the Berlin government quickly shut them down. They learned their lesson from the cap push. In future years, the men of the Freikorps would become a staple of German right-wing politics, being active in everything from moderate conservative groups to nationalist terrorist organizations. Many even went on to join the National Socialists. This included Martin Bormann, Rudolf Hess, Reinhard Heydrich, and Heinrich Himmler. One active Freikorps even participated in Hitler's Beer Hall push. So when assessing the Freikorps' place in politics, it's not quite right to say they had an ideology. The Freikorps were more of a historical phenomenon produced by their circumstances. They were also decentralized, so different units and individuals had different beliefs and motivations. This all means that the best way to assess the Freikorps would be to identify their most common schools of thought. The one point that every last Freikorpsman would agree on would be anti-communism. It is impossible to have been a part of the Freikorps and not be an anti-communist. Next, nearly all of them were nationalists. Less common was monarchism, but it was very popular among the officers. And finally, a smaller number of Freikorpsmen would have subscribed to racism and anti-Semitism. But they were mostly present in the later years and concentrated in Bavaria and among the Baltic campaigners. It should also be noted that there were definitely Jews in the Freikorps, just not very many. And that's the German Freikorps. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. And if you'd like to help us make more videos like this one, support us through Patreon, Subscribestar, becoming a channel member, PayPal, and crypto, links to all of which can be found below. Up next, we're going to talk about some of the ideas the Freikorps were fighting against. Ideas which many would end up adopting themselves in a roundabout sort of way. I'll see you then. Es gibt nur ein Gebot, die 
Helme auf und Fels gezogen. Es geht um Freude.